Um, so thanks everyone for coming to this event. Um, this is uh, the first event of the final term of this year. So uh, we're delighted to have Simon Cotman with us. Uh, Simon is a PhD candidate at uh, Australia National University and a freelance journalist. His research mainly focuses on online misogyny, uh, extremism and uh, male violence. And uh, the format will be, we'll have about a 45 minute talk from Simon and then we'll have uh, 15 minutes of questions from you. So if you have any questions, just during the talk, put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the talk. Uh, now, under Simon, thank you very much. Uh, great, thank you very much, um, Students Against Student Science for having me. What I'm just gonna do is share my screen so that the slides are up. Um, and press play for start. Now everyone can see that okay. Can I just get some thumbs up? I always like to double check. Um, so uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm presenting here from Canberra in Australia where uh, it's cold tonight. Um, uh, I'd like to first acknowledge that I'm presenting on Ngunnawal and Ngambri land and pay respects to Indigenous elders past, present and emerging and recognise that the land I'm speaking on today uh, was never ceded. Um, what I want to do today is talk to you about the pseudoscience of the manosphere. So in particular, I'm going to go through how men's rights groups uh, in the manosphere and online sphere uh, use pseudoscientific ideas to justify their misogyny and attacks on feminism. I'm going to go through uh, particular texts from men's rights uh, for manosphere activists uh, on particularly from Reddit, uh, which is where my main study uh, focus. Uh, and talk about the kind of uh, particularly evolutionary psychology that they use and how they think about uh, differences in gender uh, between uh, different genders um, and the way that that uh, underpins their ideology. So let's just get started. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by reading a long post from the Reddit subreddit r slash the red pill. Uh, the red pill is a subreddit dedicated to manosphere ideas. Um, and as I'll discuss in this presentation, has a high profile theory section, uh, which is dedicated to pseudoscientific concepts, pr primarily based in evolutionary psychology. I start with this post, which is titled Life or Primitive Jane, The Boys Are Hunting, as it provides a great introduction to the ideas that underpin, underpin much of the discourse in the community. Uh, I think the story is quite interesting. Uh, it's, it's a little bit long, but I think I wanna read it out in full to give you a real sense of what they talk about. Uh, in particular how about how they think about sex and relationships and how they use uh, evolutionary psychology to, uh, to understand these, kind of, these ideas. Uh, so here goes. So it's life or primitive Jane, the boys are hunting. Jane wakes up under the bare fur that she shares with two other females. It's 100,000 years ago and it's freaking cold outside. The fire at the entrance of the cave has been reduced to a few glowing embers. She glances over at Bob Rick, uh, Bob Nick, the only other male left behind by the hunting party and whose mission it is to protect the females. His skinny ass is fast asleep near the almost extinguished fire with a spear laying near him. Jane grumbles and walks back to the entrance where she throws a couple of sticks on the fire. If the fire dies, it's a pain in the ass for everyone. She then goes out of the cave and squats to relieve herself on the ground. She smells grease, sweat and shit, but she's still one of the most attractive females of the tribe. Her hips are wide, her breasts are heavy, she still has almost all her teeth and there is meat on her bones. When she turns back, she no notices Bob Nick, who woke up staring at her naked ass. She smiles and winks seductively at him. She hates this useless fucker, but if the boys don't come back from the hunt, he'll be the only male available to protect the tribe. It's been four nights since the hunting party has left and still no sign of them. The females are starting to become agitated, hungry, and above all, afraid. What if they don't come back? It will mean death for a big part of the tribe, unable, unable to sustain itself. During the day, they go to gather fruits and seeds in the nearby forest under the protection of Bob Nick and his spear, but they stay in the cave, sewing or polishing stones. But there isn't much to do, and mostly they talk. If the hunting party doesn't come back, Bob Nick becomes a de facto leader of the group. He was left behind because he's the weakest of the males, and usually the whole tribe makes fun of him, and nobody shows him much respect. But now every female is eyeing him and smiling at him. Jane is Chad Rock's main female, or at least she competes for the top position. She knows how to gently lay on his lap and lick his penis when he's resting. She knows how to ride him to shivering orgasm, orgasms, and she knows how to stroke the back of his head to make him fall asleep at, nice, at night between her breasts. 
Chadrock also fucks other females, in particular Uma, who is younger, and Jane always has to improve her game to keep him coming back to her. Chadrock is who all the females want. He's the best hunter. It seems like he leads the boys, although they always take serious stuff away from the females. And he's fucking huge. Jane loves Chadrock. But now it's getting late and she's eyeing Bobnik. Uma is sitting near him and giggling and caressing his hair. Bobnik is visibly happy, but can't believe his luck just yet and is not doing anything. Maybe the boys will be back tomorrow. Jane can't take the risk. She can't let Uma have him. She has to preserve her place at the top of the female hierarchy. Jane walks to them and squats in front of Bobnik, opening her naked ass and winking at him, just like she did in the morning when she was taking a shit. That's too much for poor Bobnik, who throws Uma to the side and jumps on Jane and immediately starts to fuck her furiously. She's not wet and it hurts, but the pain is nothing compared to the pleasure of seeing Uma's angry face in the corner of her eye. Jane is moaning sensually to make this go faster, but then a shadow fills the cave and her moans change to screams and as she suddenly tries to push Bobnik away. A huge wooden mass comes slamming on the side of Bobnik's head and his brain splatters on the cave wall while Jane escapes from under him. It's Chad Rock. With one hand, he throws Bobnik's dead body to the side like a piece of wood. He and the other males behind him carry a load of meat. They look exhausted. Jane starts to thank him profusely, saying that Bobnik forced himself on her. But Chadrock cuts her short with a heavy slap to the face. She falls back on the ground. She can taste blood in her mouth. Chadrock then throws the meat to the side and starts to fuck her. Chadrock is way bigger than Bobnik, but it doesn't hurt. She's instantly wet. She's relieved too. The anguish of the days pa past days has vanished. They will survive. And he chose to fuck her instead of Uma. Jane is happy. Lessons learnt. This has been going on for 200,000 years. Modern society has only listed for a few centuries, less than 1% of that time. Guess how our genes are wired. So this post, uh, as you can see, is quite uh, interesting. Uh, and it tries to tease out uh, on the manosphere a few lessons that they talk about quite frequently. What are the lessons that they're talking about here? Well, there are a few. First, men are the primary protectors of women, both in terms of their safety and well-being, as well as providing for them uh, in terms of food and other, other resources. Secondly, men have naturally have a high sex drive and will sleep around in their tribe or in their community. Uh, women, however, are more inclined to naturally want to partner with one man at a time. And most importantly, women seek mates for status and power. Jane sought after Chadrock because he was the highest status man in the group. He had, and as we'll discuss later, uh, a term I'll discuss later, high sexual market value, which drove her attention and her attraction. She only became, became interested in Bobnik after the belief that Chadrock had died, um, and with Bobnik now potentially being the highest status male available. However, this was her, uh, uh, um, her settling. It was her settling as he was never actually good enough for her. Um, and either way, she's always seeking status and power in her mate. So what I want to do is talk about this story writ large across the manosphere and how they use evolutionary psychology to understand these kind of um, ideas and how it plays out in today's discourse. But first, a little bit, oh, first I wanted to quickly have a look at the comments from this post, which I just always make me laugh. These are the top comments on this post. Uh, and you can see uh, immediately the uh, top comments are all about the guys. Uh, the top one with 400, 546 votes being, I have the weirdest boner right now. And that runs throughout that thread about guys feeling aroused by that story, which always makes me, gives me a little bit of giggle. So what I wanna do, uh, first, what I want to do is say this post appeared on, the, on a subreddit called r slash the red pill, which is part of the manosphere. So I'm going to introduce the manosphere before then talking about the evolutionary psychology that they use to underpin their ideas. So what is the manosphere? According to Know Your Meme, uh, and the manosphere is a neologism used to describe a loose network of blogs, forums, and online communities on the speaking, uh, English speaking web that are devoted to a wide range of men's interests, from life philosophies and gender relations to self-improvement tips and strategies for sex in life, relationships, and sex. The Manosphere is part of a broader anti-feminist tra tradition that exists within the men's rights movement, which itself is deeply connected to the far right. Um, as Ging argues, and as I'm gonna show in this presentation, most Manosphere get, discourse gains its rhetoric from evolutionary psychology and genetic determinism, ideas that rely heavily on essentialized biological understandings of men and women. Members of the Manosphere argue that society is gynocentric, uh, that women have more social advantage and social value than men do. 
Uh, these men argue that traditional gender roles have given men purpose within social systems, but that the rise of femin feminism has broken this balance. Um, further entrenching gynocentrism to the point that men have little to no purpose at all, except to be subservient to women. Uh, these groups believe that feminism and progressives, uh, progressive social change in general have left men purposeless, uh, leaving society unfairly advantageous to women. Uh, this ideology aligns heavily with much of the far right uh, and the alt right, with both groups having a general disposition to expressing resentment about changing social norms and structures. Manosphere ideas tap into many of the gendered and at times race essentialist assumptions behind alt right ideology. Uh, in particular, the alt right and the manosphere both appeal to men who feel socially isolated and alienated, uh, men who see themselves as left behind and oppressed by recent social changes. Uh, and this creates a natural link between these two groups. Uh, then the Manosphere exists primarily online, and this is where I'm studying it, particularly on Reddit, um, but it is also found on places like 4chan and 8chan, Twitter, YouTube, um, anywhere online you could probably find it. Um, and members of the Manosphere have engaged in a range of what we, what uh, online theorists call network harassment campaigns, um, such as a Gamergate being the most famous of those, um, but also the Thought Audit uh, a couple of years ago, which was a campaign in which men reported sex workers to the IRS, uh, and the Fappening, which was a uh, release of an illegal release of a trove of um, uh, photos, naked photos of celebrities that were then spread around the web. Um, some members, Manosphere members have also been involved in violent attacks, in particular the Elliot Rogers uh, Isla Vista attacks in 2014, where he killed six people, and the Alec Manassian attacks in 2018 in Toronto, where he killed 10 people. Um, so the Manosphere consists of a number of different um, sub communities. I'll just quickly talk about what those sub communities are. So you have men's rights activists. Um, there's a long history behind men, men's rights activists, uh, but they mainly engage in political activity, uh, campaigning around uh, things like uh, family courts, uh, domestic violence, um, and really anti-feminist ideas. Um, the ones that I'm more focused on are ones that are focused, the other three, the red pill, MGTOW, and incels. Um, and these men are more interested in sex and relationships and talking about um, uh, the history of sex and relationships and their sort of alienation with modern sexual norms. So the red pill are strongly aligned with pickup artists. Uh, what they all believe, all of these groups is uh, kind of what I was saying before about sex and relationships that they've sort of turned against men and that social norms are not particularly good for men anymore. Uh, and these three groups all engage in this in different kinds of ways. So the red pill and pickup artists, uh, they engage in um, a whole bunch of self-help, uh, things like going to the gym, getting better posture. They're strongly aligned with people like Jordan Peterson um, and also learning this thing called game, which is a range of techniques that they use to pick up women. Uh, and there are um, places uh, around the world where people go and learn game and practice it on the streets. And there's been, associ been strongly associated uh, with um, harassment of women in public places. Uh, MGTOW is called uh, Men Going Their Own Way. Uh, this often um, comprises of men a little bit older, uh, in their 40s and 50s, often men who have um, experienced, have been in long-term relationships and been through divorce. Uh, and what they believe is that uh, relationship norms are so bad for men, um, and particular that women in general are so bad and so toxic, uh, that men shouldn't be in relationships with women at all, uh, and that they should, men should go their own way. Uh, and often this is men who have been, um, uh, had bad experiences and then they decide I'm never gonna be in a relationship with a woman again. Uh, and in MGTOW, there's different levels of, of where this goes. Uh, so this can involve just not entering, entering into marriage, for example, all the way to some men who believe that they need to distance themselves from women and never have no contact with women at all, or even have no contact with society at all. Go and live in the woods by yourself and be a hermit effectively. And there's a whole range of people in, in that spectrum. Uh, and the final group, incels, is probably the most famous of the Manosphere communities. It's one people ask me about the most, and I think it has the most research associated with it, um, particularly because of the violent attacks from Elliot Rogers and Alec Manassian. Um, they're a group of men who believe that uh, women um, are so uh, unwilling to date them, um, particularly because of their looks, uh, that they're never going to have romantic or sexual relationships. They can't get sex, they can't get romance, they can't ever enter a date. You hear men who are, this is particularly young men, it's often ranging from people ranging from 50 to 30, 15 to 30, uh, who believe that they can't get into relationships. Uh, and they often end up taking their anger out at women for being unwilling to date them. And that's exactly what Elliot Rogers and Alec Manassian did, amongst other men who have taken out uh, violent attacks. 
Uh, so altogether, these two communities, uh, these communities uh, involve taking what is uh, what they call either the red pill, which is the most common phrase, or the black pill. Uh, this is a concept concept taken from the Matrix. So in the Matrix, uh, you take you get off, offered either the blue pill or the red pill, uh, and the blue pill is you uh, in the Matrix. You stay in the Matrix. In the red pill, you learn about what's underpinning the Matrix. Uh, you leave the Matrix and you um, and understand the reality of the world. And so men's rights groups and manosphere people have adopted this term um, to say that what they're doing is taking the red pill. They're learning about the truth of society. They're learning about the truth of feminism uh, and they're learning about the realities of the world and they're leaving the kind of false uh, consciousness of uh, what it is to be in the blue pill, which is to sort of be stuck in a feminist, uh, socially progressive world, uh, which is not good for anybody. Uh, and so there's two different terms of this. So the red pill is the most common um, and the red pill is described here um, in uh, the subreddit, the red pill uh, is the recognition and awareness of the way that feminism, feminism, feminists and their white knight enablers affect society An awareness of the dark truth surrounding human sexuality, hypergamy, women's AFBB strategies, which is alpha fucks and beta bucks. I'll talk about that a little bit later um, in the talk. Um, society's feminine imperative, so the belief that uh, society is inherently feminine or is pushing femininity on men. Um, sexual differences in emotional attachment and women's attraction to DT traits, which is dark triad traits, uh, which is a combination of uh, that women, are, this is a belief that women are attracted uh, primarily to narcissists, uh, Machiavellianism and psychopath psych yeah, psychopathy. Uh, and this is something that they believe in. Again, I'll sort of talk about this a little bit more in the talk. Um, and sexual dominance and violence. And the black pill uh, is a more nihilistic version of the red pill. Um, so in the red pill, it's a recognition of uh, these, these issues and, a, and a strategies that are used to then overcome it by, um, by learning game and things like that. The black pill is more nihilistic um, and it's particularly prominent in incel communities. And the black pill is a philosophy that female sexual desire is very inflexible and hence men's dating problems require systemic rather than personal solutions if solutions exist at all. And a lot of people in intel communities believe that no solutions exist at all. They're just never gonna get a date. They're never gonna have a relationship. Um, so for these black pillars, ugly and genetically inferior men have no chance of getting laid in an unconstrained mating context as women are assumed to choose based on looks rather than personality or effort. And so it's, it's very nihilistic. It's very uh, down And in, in, in these communities, you see people talk very frequently about things like what they call roping, which is committing suicide because they just have, don't, don't see any purpose in their life at all. And the black pill is that kind of underpins that very nihilistic view of the world. Okay, so that's a little bit of an uh, introduction to the manosphere. Uh, what I'm gonna now do is go through and talk about uh, the, uh, particularly the evolutionary psychology that underpins the manosphere uh, through what uh, some theorists call, uh, is described as a new biologism. Uh, I'm gonna go through uh, sort of, um, the rise of evolutionary psychology in popular media and um, academic discourse over the past couple of decades. And then I'll talk about how the manosphere adopts, has adopted those terms and those ideas. So underpinning the notion of the red and black pill is a biological essentialism about the differences between men and women when it comes to sexual and romantic relationships. Um, manosphere members in particular use ideas from evolutionary psychology to explain inherent differences between men and women when it comes to relationships, as well as to justify misogyny directed at women. Um, evolutionary psychology argues that many aspects of human personality and behavior, which modern social scientists have treated as cultural constructs, for instance, for instance, sexual preferences, dietary habits, or child rearing practices, are in fact the products of biological adaptation, reflecting the ways in which our earliest ancestors dealt with the conditions of prehistoric life. That's a quote from Cameron. Um, in regards to sexuality, therefore, evolutionary psychology argues that there are inherent differences in the way in which men think, behave, and feel, with an argument that evolution made men's and women's minds as unalike as it made their bodies. This bio, new, biolog, new biologism, I've just realized how difficult that word is to say, um, is not new or a distinct notion in the manosphere, um, but instead sort of taps into prominent discourse around sex and sexuality, one that's particularly re-arisen in the 21st century or the late 20th and early 21st century. Uh, Cameron, who is a great uh, thinker in this area, argues that in the 21st century has seen a rise of what she describes as this new biologism. Uh, she describes this as, and I quote, a 21st century revival of the traditional view that differences between men and women are not um, as feminists would have it socially constructed, 
but natural rooted in our biological makeup. Again, this notion isn't new. Uh, biological essentialism it has hung around for been around and particularly around gender and sexual differences for quite a long time. Um, but this is one that uh, particular, this new biologism particularly critiques 20th century feminism and has re-arisen in the late 20th century and early 21st century. Um, so Cameron dates this back to the, the 1990s in particular, uh, in which sex differences became a popular and dominant theme in popular science writing. Um, so this was driven in particular by books such as Men Are From Mars and Women From Venus, which is on the screen there, which is a very famous book, uh, And You Just Don't Understand, um, by Deborah Tannen. These books pro fo primarily focused on language and communication and were focused on solving relationship problems with gender differences being treated as a fact of life uh, with little questioning about the underlying causes. And both argue that you don't need to change these underlying causes, you don't need to change your behaviour, but men and women need to learn about the, the inherent differences of the other sex, uh, and that is how you can make relationships work. Um, but as the 90s came to a close, um, popular science writing became, began to focus more heavily on these supposed underlying causes with a grow, growing focus on scientific explanations of the differences between men and women. And this saw a subtle shift in the underlying message in which authors began to argue that men and women cannot be changed and that feminist efforts to re-engineer uh, what uh, scientists now understand to be their biologically ordained natures has proved futile and damaging. So it becomes very strongly linked to um, uh, critiquing feminism. A core part of this um, uh, is a retapping into this idea that there are distinct male and female brains. Uh, these different brains provide answers to the different social status and roles of men and women in society. So this is uh, probably really uh, clear stereotypes that we're probably all aware of, but the stereotypes are that men, the male brain is very rational, it's analytical, it's cognitive, it's taxon taxonomical, uh, whereas the female brain, it's caring, it's emotional, it's people focused. Uh, we can see this an example in this book uh, from Simon Baron Cohen called The Essential Difference. Um, he argues that people with the female brain make the most wonderful counsellors, primary school teachers, nurses, carers, therapists, social workers, mediators, group facilitators, or personal staff, because they're very caring, they're very emotional, people focused, and these are people focused jobs. People with the male brain make the most wonderful scientists, engineers, mechanics, technicians, musicians, architects, electricians, plumbers, taxonomists, catologists, uh, bankers, tool makers, programmers, or even lawyers. Again, because these apparently are very rational jobs and analytical jobs and cognitive jobs that you then, so this is why the male and female brain works uh, are best for these things. One thing to note as well, this, tap strong this taps in strongly into modern gender assumptions, which assume that men um, are actors in the public sphere while work women work in the private sphere. And uh, you see a lot of this, um, material that then talks about this, uh, the male brain is more uh, for the public sphere. So that's why you have more male politicians, you have more male top CEOs and these sorts of things while women are more likely to be in the private sphere. That's why they're teachers, they're carers, uh, they're nurses, these sorts of things. Uh, and this, this uh, essentializes this dichotomy, this difference between the professions, between people's roles, um, and it says that brains are what causes this. So it's our inherentness, not, um, so, so, not society in any way. Much of this um, is aligned deeply with, therefore with post-feminist movements. And it in particular argues that femi feminism has gone too far in arguments that sex and gender are socially constructed. So post-feminism is a movement that emerges in the late 20th and early 21st century in a backlash to what is considered the excesses of um, feminism. It doesn't necessarily argue against female equality, but, and in fact, it often recognizes the victories of a lot of feminism, but it says that we've moved past the point where we need feminism and argues instead that we are living in a post-feminism world where equality has already been achieved. Post-feminism is also very neoliberal and individualist uh, with a focus on choice and individual emancipation for women. So the argument is that we've already leveled the playing fields, uh, and then what we need to do now is give women the choice and emancipate and you know, individual emancipation to be able to have the choice to do whatever they want and to achieve what they want. Um, and this aligns strongly with biologically determinist ideas um, because what they say is, look, we, we, we all uh, are making these choices to enter in these stereotypical jobs, for example, um, 
but with some constraints about what our brain, about our brains. So trying to force people, force more women to be politicians makes no sense because women are making the choice to do to not do that because of some of their makeup in their brain um, and vice versa. So post-feminism therefore represents a taking for granted of feminist ideas alongside a fierce repudiation of feminism. It's an emphasis upon choice, freedom and individual empowerment. A preoccupation with the body and sexuality is the focus of femininity and masculinity. Um, a reassertion of natural sexual difference grounded in heteronormative ideas about gender complementarity. Uh, and again, we can see this play out strongly in new, in new biologism. So this is another famous book of uh, uh, sort of pop evolutionary psychology. Uh, and this uh, quote is from the back of the book. Uh, the book is called Why Men Don't Iron, The Reality of Gender Differences. Uh, and what it's, uh, this quote says is much of what is written and taught today presumes that most of the differences between women and men have been caused by society and then can therefore be altered. Once this is done, men and women will become alike. And so men are challenged, pestered and lectured to change from the old dominant male to get in touch with their feminine side. But what if the feminine side doesn't exist? Men's brains are in fact wired very differently from women's, so their reactions to stimuli cannot be the same. Thus, increasing feminization of society, of food and of education is detrimental to men and eventually will be to women too. So how does the manosphere tap into this new biologism? Um, while there have been multiple multitudes of debates within the evolutionary psychology field, um, and also within the manosphere itself, a succinct explanation of the dominant manosphere understandings of the evolutionary uh, psychology is provided in a blog post that I'm gonna go through uh, by a, a top manosphere uh, thinker called Rollo Tomasi. Uh, this blog post is called Schedules of uh, Mating, and it features prominently in the theory section of the Red Pill, which is um, the, the subreddit that I posted earlier. Uh, tapping in, this, this uh, blog post taps into explanations of sexual differences within evolutionary psychology, um, which is really prominent already. Um, and in this post, Tommaso argue, Tomasi argues that evolutionarily, the most successful males are those who maximise their opportunities to mate, in turn, spreading their genes to a widest pool as possible. On the other side of the ledger, however, due to the potentially significant long-term commitment that can arise from sexual behaviour in the form of pregnancy, uh, successful women are required to choose their mates more carefully and, are in, turn, and in, in turn are more discerning when it comes to having sex. Women seek higher status partners, ones who can provide for the child in terms of genes, financially, and in regards to social status. So this is a theme that's really common in evolutionary psychology itself, or at least in pop evolutionary psychology. So for example, the evolutionary psychologist Steven Pinker described this uh, dynamic by stating a prehistoric man who slept with 50 women could have sired 50 children and would have been more likely to have descendants who inherited his tastes. A woman who slept with 50 men would have had no more descendants than a woman who slept with one. Thus men should seek quantity of sexual partners, women, quality, a source of their protection, resources, and good genes for their children. So this is a theme that's already prominent in evolutionary psychology. And you see in this blog post from Tomasi a, um, that he uh, really taps into this. And so uh, this is a quote from the uh, blog post that his um, blog is called The Rational Male, and he has a book called The Rational Male as well. So he echoes this sentiment almost exactly. He argues that it's simple deductive logic to follow that for some species to survive, it must provide its off offspring with the best possible conditions to ensure its survival. Either that or to reproduce in such quantity that ensures survival. The obvious application of this for women is sharing parental investment with the best possible mate her own genetics allow her to attract and who can provide long-term security for her and any potential offspring. Thus women biologically, psychologically, and sociologically, um, uh, the filters of their own reproduction, whereas men's reproductive methodology is to scatter as much of their genetic material as humanly possible to the widest available quantity of sexually available females. So this is the kind of basis of the evolutionary psychology uh, that they talk about. And the basis is really simple. Men wanna have sex with as many women as possible in order to spread their genes. Women want to pick the top men in terms of their genes and in terms of their social status in order to have children with, um, and, in, and in doing so, they pick men who can look after and care for them. And we see this strongly in the story that I, um, that I shared with you earlier, in which Jane wants to sleep with Chad Rock because he's the best man, whilst Chad Rock and Bob Nick are trying to sleep around. And 
In the blog, Tomasi then details how these differing biological needs result in inherently different sexual behaviours from men and women, and there's lots of consequences of this. The most essential of these is one I've already spoken about, which is that men have higher sex drives with, uh, than women, um, as men are more likely to want to have sex with multiple women in order to spread their seed. Uh, and this, again, is prominent in a lot of evolutionary psychology. Um, and as Tomasi states, this is evidence in our own hormonal biology. Men possess between 12 to 17 times the amount of testosterone women do, and women produce substantially more estrogen and oxytocin, fostering feelings of security and nurturing than men. The evolutionary psychology of the manosphere therefore presents a picture of the horny, sexually promiscuous man and the frigid, frigid sexually resistant woman who is only willing to have sex with someone of higher status. However, Tomasi and other members of the Manosphere then claim that in order to protect their young, women seek to overcome these inherent differences, in particular through forcing men into monogamous relationships. Women are unwilling to allow men to have children with multiple partners as this will reduce the level of support they can provide for their child. As Tomasi states, therefore, for a woman to best ensure the survival of her young, a man must necessarily abandon uh, the method of his reproduction in favour of her own. Women in turn control the sexual reproductive marketplace. Uh, this means that uh, there's a whole range of social conventions that women enforce uh, to facilitate their own breeding methodologies. In particular, Tomasi claims these breeding methodologies have allowed women to be fickle in their sexual behaviors, always, always having the prerogative to change their mind, while men are held to a higher standard and specifically expected to do the right thing. Men who are players and sleep around are treated as villains, while fathers who selfishly sacrifice themselves financially, emotionally, and life decision-wise, often to the benefit of the children they don't father, are considered social heroes for complying with ge women's genetic imperatives. On the flip side of this, and somewhat contradictorily, Tomasi argues that these evolutionary needs uh, mean that women find it necessary to frequently cheat on their partners. And this is a based on the argument that women seek men uh, in which to have a relationship versus, sorry, seek different men in which to have a relationship versus those they want to have children with. And there's a tension between like, what they call good guys and good genes. Um, Manosphere members argue that women will seek a long-term mate who is financially and emotionally stable, the good guy, a man who can make them a long-term partner and a stable father. However, these men often don't have the best genes and women will therefore cheat on their good guy partner in order to have offspring with a guy with good genes. The good guy then ends up looking after children that aren't his. Uh, cheating can happen reactively and proactively. In reactive cheating, women, are, um, women who are already paired up with the good guy will have sex with someone with good genes, uh, with the good guy then being left responsible. Or proactive cheating or what Tomasi calls the mummy dilemma is a situation in which women breed with men with good genes, bear his children, and then abandon him in order to find a good guy who can provide for her and the children. Tomasi then argues that I want to stress again that most women do not have some consciously constructed and recognized master plan to enact this cycle and deliberately trap men into it. Rather, the motivations for this behavior and the accompanying social uh, rationales invented to justify it are unconscious process. For the most part, women are are unaware of this dynamic, but are nonetheless subject to its influence. For a female of any species to facilitate a method methodology for breeding and the best genetic partner she's able to attract and to assure, ensure her own and her offering, offspring's, uh, offspring's survival uh, with the best provisioning partner, this is an evolutionary jackpot. Because I stumbled there, I think it means I'm just near a glass of water. So these evolutionary biological requirements in turn result in two types of men, what they call chads and cucks. Chads are the good, good gene guys, those who are attractive and of high, socially high status, and in turn have a lot of sex with women. This is Chad Rock in our story before. Um, and in uh, the majority of men, however, are cuckolds or cucks. Uh, and this is Bobnik in our previous story. Cucks are the good guys, the men who end up being stuck looking after the progeny of the men with the good genes, being used primarily as a means to provide for women and children financially. Cucks are looked down upon by women, with, um, but women will often settle for them as they don't have access to a chad. Uh, many of the men in the manosphere identify, identify themselves in, in, with these good guys, being used um, by women who are currently interested in them solely for their money or their stability, for example, or to look after kids. Okay, so I'm just going to finish off by talking about the sexual marketplace. Um, so underlying this biological essentialism and evolutionary psychology is a belief that sexual and romantic relationships are part of a sexual marketplace, or what they call the SMP uh, for short. 
describing uh, the free market free market that is mating uh, in this mindset sex and relationships are not driven not by emotions or mutual connection but instead through rational biological drive to mate and further the species uh, as david graber describes um, life in this approach is therefore reduced to be to become a mere instrument for the propag propagation of dna sequences with humans acting solely through their biological needs to reproduce and nothing more uh, Manosphere participants talk about SMP in multitudes of ways, and I'm just going to talk about one way briefly in which they talk about it, uh, and that is through what they call the attraction differential. Um, located, uh, this is a popular video, uh, Manosphere video called Gen the, from a um, YouTuber called Coltane, C O L T T A I N E, um, called Gender Attraction Differential. The video ha now has over 670,000 views and is prominent in Manosphere circles. In it, Coltane goes through the statistics of what Manosphere and participants call the 80-20 rule on male and female attraction. The idea that 80% of women want to have sex or enter long-term relationships with only 20%, top 20% of men. Coltane looks at this from using data from Tinder, which states that women rate 80% of men as less attractive than average. This is the data that says that while men have a more even view of attractiveness of women. He shows that in this graph, which I'll explain in a second. Um, so he uses these graphics to detail what he describes as the male attraction threshold. I don't need the threshold of which the majority of either men or women would find a particular person of the opposite sex attractive. Um, so in this threshold, uh, this is the, the blue line is the, uh, the male attraction threshold and the pink is the uh, female. So what it shows is uh, the majority of women, so this is how they find men attractive in this blue line, um, the majority of women only find the top 20% of men attractive, whereas the majority of men will find the top 50% of men attractive. Uh, and so women basically have much higher standards. And this goes back to the evolutionary psychology that they argue that women want men of higher standards to be able to look be their mates. Coltane ascribes this attraction differential to, sex, to, to the sexual marketplace, stating that the provision of resources is probably the driving factor behind female re reproductive choices. Sexual attractiveness uh, and in turn sexual activity and relationships are based in rational decision making with women being more discerning in their sexual choices while men seek to spread their genes further and in turn find more women sexually attractive. Everyone therefore has what the Manosphere members describe as a sexual market value or SMV. This is a common phrase and refers to a shorthand statement for what you bring to the table, uh, whether for a one night stand or for a longer sexual or emotional relationship. And in the video, Coltane, for Coltane, this uh, attraction differential explains many of the issues facing men in the sexual marketplace. Uh, while the majority of women will only want to pair up with the top 20% of men in terms of their sexual market value, this is not simply not possible. There's not, they can't all um, be partnered up with the top 20% of men. Women therefore frequently settle for men of a lower sexual market value. And as he states in this kind of long quote, um, in her head, she's settling for someone she thinks is far below her social and sexual market value. This, I think, is the genesis of all these ideas about the man drought and where have all the good men gone. They're still here and frankly, they're perfectly good guys, but it isn't about raw numbers of single men, it's about perceived eligibility in the eyes of women. Attractiveness and raw population statistics just don't seem to neatly correlate in the female mind, resulting in a huge deficit between the median and mean attractiveness they perceive in men. Even though two people may exist in the exact same percentile on the population graph ranking relative attractiveness, in her mind, she sees herself as an eight dating a three. To her, it's a bad reproductive investment. But due to market pressures, i.e. she doesn't want to be lonely or she wants to start a family, these are the only men eligible in her relative population percentile, so she goes ahead and makes the relationship investment anyway. This settling, this settling is the genesis of relationship problems for men, according to the Manosphere, with Coltane in particular arguing that majority of divorces can be linked to back to this practice of settling in the first place. Divorce, he argues, is not about the impact of feminism or legal changes or domestic violence or anything. It is about biology and innate sexual dimorphic psychology. Women settle for men, they then get sick of being settle, of settling and decide to leave them later down the track. Uh, and what's notable here is the language that they use uh, with a focus of sexual marketplace and it's very neoliberal and post-feminist in their notion, uh, in, their, in their notions. Um, this is all based on the logic of individualism, one centered on irrational individuals engaging in acts that maximize individual benefits defined in terms of either finance or their progeny and it's very neoliberal in that content. 
Uh, and this theory aligns with the, leads of, the, with the needs of capitalism in which nature is treated as a universe of rational calculation driven by an apparently irrational um, uh, imperative to unlimited growth. McKinnon describes this as genetic individualism, arguing that evolutionary psychology such as that used within the manosphere naturalizes a conception of human life that reduces social relations and human behavior to the product of self-interested competition between individuals. Uh, and this, I think, is exemplified by the notion of the sexual marketplace, a space in which individual competition in sexual relations is seen as natural and inevitable. And what's interesting about this is that in this context, feminism is seen less as a movement for political and social rights, but it, it, instead as a sexual strategy. Feminism exists to enhance women's positions in the sexual marketplace, giving them advantages in sexual competition. Some manosphere participants in turn argue that men should in fact respect feminism to some extent, while recognizing at the same time that they need to stop and counter it, they need to fight back against it. So uh, this post from a user, uh, uh, PK underscore atheist, describes this in an introductory post to r slash the red pill on Reddit. Uh, he says, feminism is a sexual strategy. It puts women in the best position they can to select mates to determine when they want to switch mates to locate the best DNA possible and to garner the most resources they can, individ uh, indiv sorry, they can to individually achieve. Red pill is men's sexual strategy. Reality is happening and we need to make sure that we adjust our strategy accordingly. So I think we've got about five minutes left. So what I just want to quickly do is um, have a couple of concluding thoughts about uh, everything that I've said today. So first, this is the Students Against Pseudoscience. So I think it's worthwhile actually touching base is this pseudoscience and, and what, is, what does the science say about all of this? I mean, first, yes, I think absolutely, yes, this is pseudoscience. Um, and there's, there's strong pseudoscientific elements that run through this. Um, there's a lot of things you could say about this and a lot of people are doing writing to debunk a lot of these ideas. Uh, Cameron, who I've mentioned a lot um, today, uh, is uh, one of the key thinkers in there. Um, uh, there's a few others. I haven't actually got uh, references on this, on, this, on this PowerPoint, but if anyone wants to ask, I can send some links to you. Um, I, however, we want to say that evolutionary psychology is real and can provide some valuable insights into our behaviour. However, as Cameron notes, a lot of the discourse around the male-female brain um, and these inherent differences between men and women when it comes to sex and relationship are actually based in pop psychology and are not necessarily backed up by hard science. As you can see, I've shown you pop, pop science books today, uh, less scientific papers. Um, moreover, a lot of evolutionary psychology is based in research of prehistoric societies. Um, we don't have, however, we don't have access to prehistoric societies um, and they didn't leave written records for us to study them. So it's often really hard to uh, study prehistoric societies. Um, often so evolutionary psychologists therefore turn to, turn to modern version of prehistoric tribes, tribes that still operate in hunter-gatherer modes. You see a lot of research, for example, um, in the Amazon forests, um, in parts of Africa, for example, uh, and they try to say, well, this is what they're still like now. So this is what we must have historically been like to provide that length that uh, linear um, status. Um, but these tribes are few and far between. They have often been impacted by modern circumstances. And we also can't tell whether they're necessarily um, uh, a, an example of everything that, uh, that's happening in our world. Uh, and Donahue argues that when scientists do engage with this material, these studies are often not, not replicated. So they can create studies, but they're often then not being able to re be replicated. Uh, but I think most importantly, the evolutionary psychology puts far too much emphasis on rigid notions of gender and sexuality and do not take into account cultural practices. Uh, so previously I showed a quote from Simon Baron Cohen. This is the one about uh, the male and female brain and uh, men and women having different jobs because of their male and female brain. Um, Cameron, uh, who I've quoted a lot today, has an excellent refutation of this, which I just want to read, briefly read because I think it's really great. She says his categor categorization of the occupations he refers to is informed more by gender stereotypes than by any scientific analysis of what skills or personal qualities the work demands. He does not notice, for example, that nursing requires as much systemizing and empathize as empathizing. A caring nurse who could not make a systemic clinic clinical observations, measure dosages accurately or handle technology would never get through the training. Conversely, a highly logical lawyer with no ability to communicate or read people, I don't need judge when they're lying, would, be, would have difficulty in practicing most kinds of law successfully. Baron Cohen can only have categorized these jobs as female and male brain respectively because he knows most because he knows most nurses are women and most lawyers are men. His classification naturalizes and so justifies a state of affairs that clearly arises from historical social inequalities. It is sexism masquerading as science. 
Donahue have also referenced backs this up. She says that in psychology in particular, there's a, a real focus in pl brain plasticity. Um, the idea, which, is, which has been scientifically proven, that human brains change based on our cultural and, circles, um, and uh, social experiences. There's even research that shows that people's brains change after receiving therapy, that they're plastic, our brains are plastic. Plast plasticity is a main area of research in psychology and evolutionary biology at the moment. Yet Donahue argues that when it comes to gender and sexuality, plasticity is thrown out the window and research still assumes that our brains are hardwired in terms of our gender. In turn, there is an obsessive search for the differences between men and women and a drive to understand these as being inherently natural. Uh, and this is very strongly aligned with these post-feminist ideas uh, and what and Fine calls this a kind of version of neurosexism. Uh, secondly, what are the consequences of this evolutionary psychology? And this is my last slide. I think I might go one minute over. Um, evolutionary psychology and biological essentialism is therefore like a really integral part of the manosphere and particularly in their attempts to develop a theory of sexuality and one in particular that can uh, explain the challenges men face in sexual and romantic relationships. Um, as O'Neill describes, evolutionary psychology used, is used to embed a belief in the existence of the universal truth in sex, sexuality, ones which ultimate, uh, which ultimate effect is that purported differences between men and women and the inequalities of these occasion are naturalized as a matter of genetic inheritance. Um, it's also a way to use to explain feminism, framing feminism as part of gender wars um, that exist in the sexual marketplace. This in turn creates a justification of critiques and attacks on feminism. And I think for men in the manosphere, these explanations, these evolutionary psychology explanations are seen as a double-edged sword. On the one end of the, end of the sword is genetic determinism, determinism explains gender differences and provides the means for which men can justify misogynistic attacks. Um, men in particular use evolutionary psychology to engage in the othering of women, uh, which is a process of uh, differentiation and demarcation in which they create a diff uh, different groups, us and them, uh, we and, and create a different a situation which men are seen as inherently different to women, uh, creating an in-group and an out-group. Uh, this they then can position themselves as the in group as completely opposite to the out group, which uh, allows them to um, to engage in misogynistic attacks against them because they're justified as being other. They're completely different from us. Um, othering often is is quite common in in hate groups um, and was strongly um, seen in white supremacist groups in in Nazis etc. Evolutionary psychology allows them to do this, creating this divide. Um, in addition, evolutionary psychology provides manosphere members with opportunity to engage in coherent attacks against feminism, which I've already said. On the other side of the, the sword, however, these explanations naturalize the problems men face in sexual romantic relationships. It creates inherent truths around sexuality and sex, making men feel kind of impotent in their ability to change their status. Uh, and this can result in a range of different responses, including nihilism, which I've spoken about associated with men's fates, as in the case of incels, uh, which can lead to serious mental health problems. And as, a, as, a, as I noted once before, um, uh, high suicide rates. Uh, it results in a desire to give up on relationships um, and society entirely, or this kind of feeling of this constant need to better oneself in order to be able to enter into the top 20% of the male attractiveness and in turn to be able to obtain a long-term sustainable relationship. Either way, I would argue that none of these solutions are sustainable or actually can bring happiness to these men um, because they don't deal with some of the root causes of the problems that they're facing. So biological essentialism and pseudoscience are therefore essential to the manosphere ideology. It underpins their understandings of sexuality, their response to feminism and the way in which they engage in sexual and romantic relationships. And at that point, I think I will finish and say thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have, um, well, I've had three people so far uh, say that they would like to ask a question. Um, if there's anyone else who'd like to ask a question, just uh, message it to me, um, or, well, just message you have a question and uh, I'll let you uh, ask it yourself, or if you'd rather not ask it yourself, message it to me and I'll read it out. Um, what I'll do is, um, sorry, I'll just stop the share as well so we can yeah, just no, that'd see. Yeah, be good, thank you. So there was a number of questions from, um, from uh, William Costello. Um, I think because you've got some other people, I might, I might ask you to just sort of focus on one, um, but if you'd like to uh, turn on your camera or turn on your mic and, and ask that, uh, please go. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, and I'll try, try and keep it brief. Thanks first for your talk, Simon. Re really found it interesting. 
Um, so the great feminist and intersectional activist Kimberly Crenshaw uh, is famously quoted as saying, treating different things the same can generate as much inequality as treating the same things differently. I think I would agree with that. Um, and in keeping with the theme of the program on pseudoscience, it just seems extremely unusual for me that you consider evolutionary psychology pseudoscience. Would you not consider the human brain like all other human biology as a product of evolution? And are humans not a sexually dimorphic species with different evolutionary selection pressures? So specifically around sex differences in mate preferences and sexual strategies, those in particular are some of the most robust and replicable findings in all of science, not just psychology. And more generally, two of the main evolutionary psychology journals are in the top 10 of the replicability tables in all of psychology also. So I would suggest that perhaps a better approach might be to engage with actual evolutionary psychologists rather than elevating the likes of Rollo Tomasi, a blogger, uh, and Reddit forum writer to the status of thought leader. Um, it seems to me that while a lot of the manosphere will fall for the naturalistic fallacy, then they'll consider what is natural to be what's good, which evolutionary psychology never does, by the way. However, it feels to me that you're committing the moralistic fallacy, that is to find some scientific findings so unpalatable that they shouldn't be acknowledged. Uh, the final question I would ask is, um, if your biosocial culture role theory is uh, the better way to explain the sex differences, why does every um, scientific study that compares both theories uh, not find that to be the case? And why would you consider that sex differences are more pronounced in the most egalitarian uh, countries like Sweden and Norway, which seems to contradict your theory? Okay, so there's a lot in that. Um, <laughs> What I, what I think I'd just say very briefly is that um, the reason I elevate Rolla Tomasi is because I'm researching the manosphere and I'm researching the way in which they use evolutionary psychology um, to push pseudoscientific ideas. Uh, so I'm not trying here to trash all of evolutionary psychology or evolutionary biology. Uh, I don't think that's what I said in my talk. Uh, I, looking at the way in which they take elements of it um, and they um, uh, change it. They uh, they take some of the some of the most pop scientific elements. And as I said, this is why pop science is something that I focus on heavily because it's they they take in those pop scientific elements um, to create pseudoscientific ideas. Um, I'm not uh, an evolutionary psychologist myself, and I'm I'm not going to go into the full depth of all of evolutionary psychology to understand all of this. Um, and what I'm trying to get at here is to look at the way it's being used um, to push pseudoscientific ideas and in particular to, ju to justify misogynistic and anti-feminist ideas. Uh, so I'm not going to try and uh, respond to this by going through in depth all of the understandings of evolutionary psychology. All I'm talking about is the way in which it's used by these communities uh, in pseudoscientific ideas and in particular um, to uh, push uh, really misogynistic ideas um, really strongly. And again, that's why I focus on pop, sci pop science and that's why I focused on people like Rollo Tomasi and the Manosphere because that's the research that I'm doing. Great, thanks. Yeah, so in, in some ways, it's as much a defense of evolutionary psychology against the misappropriation of the likes of Rollo Tomasi. It's just a- Yeah, a, you, you like can say that. that. Uh, and you can say that. And I, and I did have a line in there where I said, look, there's a lot uh, that can be said for evolutionary psychology um it's not as i said it's not my in my field so I, I can't go into all of the depth of, of it um but it is a defense into to some extent of the of it because it, it gets misused in, in in pop science in particular uh gets used when it comes to talking about gender differences i think we agree right. there um i think i think sorry sorry i i realize uh, william might have more questions i'm, I'm sure you can I post them to you on, on Twitter or, or, have, or have, however you want to communicate, but just so we have time for other people. So thank you very much for that question. Um, so the next person, unfortunately, I, I'm not sure if this is your, uh, it's uh, uh, Bushri is, is the name I see here. Um, so I'll, I'll let you ask that yourself. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, Simon Van Cohen is a, is a professor at Cambridge and he even gave us a couple of lectures for medics in our first year. So I was really surprised <laughs> to see such a pseudoscientific and like a bit 
weird quote from him on the male and female brain. Did he did he ever respond to uh, Cameron and others' criticisms of his uh, ideas or? Um, not that I'm aware of. I can't, I couldn't tell you um, whether okay. he has or not. So I'm not sure. Oh, okay. So what's what's uh, so you, would you say that the uh, that, that any any sort of differences between men and women is entirely down to sort of cultural sort of cultural evolution rather than uh, neurological differences or how do you sort of characterize it? <laughs> Getting a lot of these questions. No, I'm not necessarily saying that. Um, what I'm saying is that um, they that uh, the manosphere overemphasizes uh, the role of evolutionary psychology. Uh, or what they call evolutionary psychology um, to be able to um, uh, justify their misogyny, justify the othering of women. Uh, as I said, I'm not an evolutionary psychologist, so I can't tell you all about the in-depth versions of this and tell you about the, the particular nuances. Um, obviously, we have um, different, bio there are different biologies in humans. Uh, there are different uh, ways in which we have been um, uh, culturally brought up and socially brought up. Uh, there are different um, needs when it comes to, to mating, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to go into all of the full details of that, so I'm not making that claim. Um, but what I'm saying is I'm talking about the way in which the manosphere weaponizes this science uh, to justify their misogyny and their anti-feminism. Thank you very much. So Thank I've you. got um, four, four more questions to go. I think maybe uh, in the interest of time, I don't know how much longer you have left, Simon, but we might- As long uh, as you want. Okay, well, okay, we'll do those four. We'll see how much time we have left. Um, but next question, I think was Pablo. Yeah, it's Pablo next. So I'll, I'll let you turn on your mic. Yes, cool. Thanks so much, Simon. That was super interesting. I've learned a lot. I mean, I'm having kind of a similar question to the two already asked. So just um, maybe to try to, to get this a bit clearer. So how you exactly draw the line between people who just in terms of their status and reputation are not pseudoscientists so people like Steven Pinker or, or Simon Baron Cohen who are very well well regarded and and they are in the field of evolutionary evolutionary psychology which is a contested field too I mean the, the people mm -hmm. you, you've cited and it's a question how we should interpret interpret these findings and it's not clear that evolutionary psychologists have the sole um, authority over how we should interpret them, right? So there is some contest going on, but that seems to me to be within science, right? That seems to be philosophers, uh, sociologists, psychologists debating how to make sense of that. So that to me doesn't seem to already be, or does not not allow for the pseudoscientific thing from a bit of a more laid back perspective. So I was just wondering if, if there's kind of a more precise way in which you would draw the line between people like Pinker and Simon Baron Cohen, I always want to say Sasha Baron Cohen, Simon Baron Cohen, um, and these blog posters or the way in which it is used? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And maybe it's something I should have been a bit more clear upon in my, um, in my talk. Um, and I think maybe it's because I, I, this is based off my thesis work in which I'm not talking necessarily about to pseudoscience. So I'm just adapting this for, uh, for this particular uh, group. Um, what I would say is you're, you're, you're in, in, inherently correct that within science there are debates about these topics, and that's true of all science. Um, we have debates around uh, these kinds of things all over the place, and there are really strong debates within evolutionary psychology that I'm aware of that um, engage in topics around this. Um, and again, what I'm trying to get is, is, is about how this is weaponized by manosphere participants who aren't scientists, who are taking these terms and they develop uh, these very strong um, theoretical basis for the material, for their ideology. Uh, and it's taking bits and pieces um, from these scientific ideas. And, and, and those quotes, um, yes, I recognize that they come from um, uh, some uh, highly respectable people. I would critique them and I would criticize them, uh, particularly, you know, I more than willing to criticize the one about the male and female brain and the, the jobs that it creates and all those sorts of things. Um, it, you can critique that within science um, and critique that within a scientific debate um, and then also recognize that that then can get weaponized by people who are pseudoscientists and who are using pseudoscience to justify a whole range of horrific things that happen online that happen in real life and that's what's happening in the manosphere. Thank you very much. Okay so uh, the next question we have is from uh, Lara so if you want to uh, turn on your mic or I can ask you uh, myself. Um, yeah, no, I just wanted to ask, like, if you kind of come across sort of men who treat women misogynistically or sort of 
say like oh you know I'm not like I'm not getting on very well in the dating sphere and the reason is because women are weaponizing their sexuality and they think of themselves as like perfectly rational and justify it using these sort of things that you've said like how, how do you deal with that especially like as a woman because like I find if I try and engage in these debates with with these men then they just sort of dismiss my opinions on the basis that you know I'm part of that whole cult of of women who weaponize their sexuality oh what a question and it's a question that I'm kind of grappling with myself uh, throughout my entire thesis about how do we engage uh with this because it's such a difficult question um, to answer and you're 100 percent correct that often trying to respond back or to fight back or to engage in debates often doesn't work it can actually entrench them um, even further into these spaces um, but and and for the exact reasons that you have outlined so if if women when women do them they when women do this they label them as irrational and um, part of a social justice warrior feminist cults and it's sort of um, they strongly, you know, they just, it just pushes them back into their own space to some extent. Um, so we don't have a full answer for how, do you, how you would engage with it uh, when it appears in your inbox or it appears on your Twitter feed or all those sorts of things. Some things that I would say is that we need, uh, when we're looking at the manosphere, what I want us to do is take a step back a little bit and look at how we can stop people from entering into the space in the first place. Um, and recognising that these men, as I kind of articulated in the, in the starting point, um, often are very um, strongly uh, socially and, and alienated. Um, they feel deep disconnect from society. They just feel deep disconnect from current social norms. Um, and we have a society that entrenches that further through um, a whole range of policies, uh, you know, neoliberal policies, um, uh, cuts to community services, cuts to a whole range of uh, social services, cuts to those sorts of things. Um, and so trying to take a step back and trying to figure out how we can deal with alienation, this kind of alienation, and put people on a different path at the early stage, particularly very young men, uh, would be a longer term strategy to sort of really dampen the effect of these spaces uh, to mean that we don't have to have this happening uh, in the first place. How we deal with the men who are already there is something I'm still grappling with and I don't really have an answer for right now, um, but it's something we need, really need to do the work on. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think we have uh, three more questions, including myself, because uh, yeah, I'm going to go for myself. Okay. But before that, um, uh, I think uh, Gabriel. Oh, yeah, yeah, Gabriel, you're next. Gabriel. Hi. Uh, thanks so much, Simon, for um, a very interesting talk. I just wanted to ask more about the um, like the red pill community, and it sounds like a lot of it is sort of commiseration. Um, between the users, but have you encountered any examples of um, these user users providing stories of, I guess, success stories of them applying these techniques or stra sexual strategies and finding, you know, a partner? Um, would they then consider themselves alphas in that sense? Or I guess the counterpoint to that is, have there been users who have kind of escaped the sort of manosphere and try to fight back, I guess, against some of these um, ideas being perpetuated in these uh, groups? Yeah, so you see, it's a really great question, thank you. Um, you see this can be different in different parts of the, the Manosphere community. So um, in the red pill, there is a, um, a lot of men who talk about their, so they, they focus heavily on, on self-help, um, going to the gym, eating better, cutting smoking, cutting cigarette, um, drinking, um, getting uh, better jobs, um, focusing on all those things so they can, they can, and learning game so that they can eventually attract women. Um, and so you do see people who write success stories, and this is particularly common in the pickup artist community um, where they talk about success stories all the time and they have, uh, in, in the red pill, they have a section called field reports where men provide field reports about going out and asking women on dates and going out and having sex for the first time or, you know, successfully hooking up with a really hot chick uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, but then you also get this really interesting thing, um, and this uh, really is underpinned by this uh, essentialist ideas, where you get men who uh, write these success, success stories uh, and then come back and say, but it was still awful. Um, so 
Uh, there's one really popular post that I was actually considering including in this, but I, I, I pulled out because of time um, from someone on the red pill. Um, and I think, uh, I can't quite remember, but the title was something like, I, um, I am now a Chad, the destroyer of pussy, is literally what it was called, uh, and which he um, talks about um, all of the things he did um, to become a Chad. Um, he becomes, um, you know, he goes to the gym, he gets a better job, he, do, he does some training and gets a better job and then goes from what I think he rates himself as a three to a nine so that he can then, and then, and then suddenly all these women are falling all over him and all of this kind of stuff and he's able to have sex with whoever he wants and it's so, so much better. But then he reports that, uh, he says that, um, uh, but then at the end, he realized that it's still all terrible because women still only want him for his status and his power. And they still only want him for his money and his looks. And they don't want him for who he is because they, that's inherently how women are. And so it's kind of this uh, upbeat story that then becomes really down pat in his mind because he he's, he's, he realizes it's all actually just meaningless and everything he did, did was meaningless. And so you have this interesting dynamic in which men say, look, I did all these things, but actually still women are just inherently bad and that's why, and it's still inherently terrible. Um, so that you get that kind of side of it in these spaces. Um, and then you certainly get people who um, leave. Um, and this is particularly true in incel communities. Um, so incels, you get a lot of, there's a lot of stories of ex-incels, men who are like, I got um, brought in and swept into this really nihilistic, um, depressed state um, and then something often happens, often it actually ends up being they have a relationship with a woman uh, and then a, they have, whether it's a friendship or a sexual or romantic relationship, they have a relationship with a woman and they get pulled out of it and they recognise how hateful they were, how misogynistic they were. And you get stories of this in the media in particular quite frequently of ex incels um, who come out of these spaces. I suspect that's probably true in the red pill and, um, and MGTOW as well, but I think it's more common in, the, in incels because there's a lot more media focus on them. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, I think what we're gonna do is we have uh, two more questions, uh, but I'm gonna go first. Um, okay, so I think contrary to maybe uh, what some people in those groups may think, uh, plenty of women get lonely, plenty of women don't have success in dating and plenty of women are online. So, and I'm sure there are similar communities uh, of women who discuss issues around uh, not having luck in love or dating. Is there anything that we can learn from comparing those communities to communities of men who are uh, facing similar problems. Oh, and uh, also, actually, that's a very good point. So, and um, Bushri also added on an extra point, which I'll, I'll just tack on, which is also um, uh, considering maybe LGBT people as well within those groups. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll do that as sort of a, a double there. Thank you, Bushri. Yeah, that's a, I mean, it's a really interesting question. It's one I don't have the best answer for at the moment because I haven't really studied those groups. Um, so, it's really hard to, to do those comparisons. Um, what I would say is, um, it's super interesting to note, and a lot of people don't know that this is the incels, the term incel and the group incels um, was actually started by a woman um, about 10 years ago. And this, this is the exact um, kind of woman you were talking about, someone who she was quite young, um, lonely, uh, was having trouble uh, getting relationships. And she um, started a group, she called them in INV cells, involuntary celibates. Uh, and it was supposed to be a self-help group. And it was about how tips of, you know, how to boost your confidence, how to be able to go out and feel comfortable asking someone else, how to feel confident that you can um, go out and, and say these things and, 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 and do that. And so it was not um, nihilistic in the way that incels have become. It didn't, wasn't based in this uh, biological essentialism that assumed that uh, women would never date, you know, that, that, that these people were never going to be able to get dates. It was more of a self-help group where people chatted and did those sorts of things. Um, I think a lot of what's happened in the manosphere is it's been taken over uh, in particular by high profile men um, who have uh, used it. I, would, I call them grifters. I say that they're grifters. They're men who, who, who sort of sweep these uh, socially alienated and isolated men into a sort of narrative um, about this. Um, and it becomes very ideological. It becomes very anti-feminist. And a lot of high profile men make a lot of money off it. Uh, and that's particularly true in the pickup artist community. You have these men um, who have created these um, companies who then make a bunch of money off them. And it's actually, um, I mean, the most famous ones are in London um, where men uh, pay, pay thousands and thousands of dollars 
um, to go on these boot camps uh, to be sold snake oil uh, and end up, uh, you know, one of the, the most famous things have happened is they they, they practice on Oxford Street in London uh, and go down the streets and try and pick up women. And it's quite, some of the stuff is quite horrific that they do. And so I think that that's probably what's happened in the manosphere in a lot of these spaces. Um, a lot of these high profile men have sort of taken over uh, and created these narratives and sort of swept people into this. Um, I'd be super interested to start researching other groups um, that don't have this. And you see this in, in men's groups. There are non men's groups that don't have this toxic um, behaviours that follow them. And it'd be interesting to see how they compare and why they don't bring in these toxic behaviours. Uh, and I agree, sort of women or LGBT groups that, um, that, that are doing this because, you know, naturally there are these kinds of groups that talk about relationships, that talk about dating, that talk about um, uh, sexual activity in these kinds of ways, and they don't end up with these kind of um, ideologies. It would be super interesting to see the comparisons and see why some work, some will happen in that way and some don't. Uh, I, I wish I could give you more of an answer, um, but I haven't done that research myself. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm just checking this in the room. I think uh, Jemima actually had a question sort of based around that. Do you, do you feel that that's been answered now or would you like to expand a little bit? Um, yeah, I was just sort of curious about, um, well, I mean, these groups don't kind of strike me as those that be super welcoming to LGBT people, but I was just curious how these sort of men's rights group would address, say, transgender women. Like, would they say, oh, this is a woman and therefore I hate her because she's female or would they say this is secretly a man? um and you know behave that sort of way um i it's a good question uh, it's interesting in that you don't see much discussion about um lgbt issues or people at, at all in these spaces it's, they're very heteronormative i think they kind of assume that there is a inherent naturalness to to heterosexuality they don't sort of engage with that and i think it's one of the um things you could critique about this, this, the science they use that they don't ever consider why some people are gay or some people are lesbian or some people yeah. are trans um, and those sorts of things. I, I would suggest that um, they would, uh, I don't think that they would um, particularly be very welcoming of trans women. Um, yeah. Um, I don't think that they would assume that they're secretly a man. I think that, or if they would, they probably treat them, think that they're men, but that they're kind of abnormal or that there's something wrong with them mm -hmm. um, and uh, that they're not real men like they are. Or they're not, you know, they're not because they're doing this weird thing um, and, if, you know, by, by changing their gender. Um, but you don't really see much of that in discourse, or at least I haven't seen in the particular communities that I'm looking at. You don't see much of that discourse within the spaces. They don't really engage in those questions very much because they're so heteronormative in the way they think about things. Yeah, and so following on from that, because um, in humans, there are a lot of sort of sex chromosome aneuploidies that are possible. Um, how would these groups treat someone who was perhaps intersex or had a different number of sex chromosomes? Yeah, I, again, this is just um, something that you don't really see much discussion yeah. about or that I haven't seen much discussion about. I reckon they would, my best guess is they would just treat them as a, as a weird abnormality, as a, as a freak of science, not necessarily as something that is common, which, is, which, which we all know that it is, um, uh, that it's, you know, it's very common in our society, even if it's not a, major, you know, not a majority, obviously, but it's very common. Um, but I, I, again, I just don't think that they engage with these abnormalities in inverted commas very much because they're so heteronormatively focused. Um, they're so assuming that every, that everything exists in this binary, um, that we have um, men and women and we have heterosexual relationships and that's how they, 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 everything is framed. And so things that are outside of that don't really come into the discourse so much because I don't know how they would necessarily deal with it. Cool, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we're gonna have one more question. Um, Actually, as a point of interest before we do, I thought you might be interested to know that there actually exists uh, a Reddit forum online called Transmaxing, where some incels decide to transition to um, increase their uh, rating in the in the dating pool, um, which, anyway, whatever, I guess. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of these kind that. of very um, obscure yeah, incel groups. Quite an obscure group. Okay, so um, one last question from uh, Bushri. And then I think we'll wrap it up. So, whenever you're ready. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, this might come across as a bit of uh, rambling, but I'll try to be brief. Uh, basically, my question is about how um, how we can sort of tackle the, the, the toxic ideas coming from the manosphere. So my understanding is that the manosphere is, you know, it, it has a very complex sort of causation. So it's coming partly based on, uh, you know, a reaction to the shifting power dynamics and how feminism is, you know, very well, to an extent, successfully challenged patriarchy. And how when, you know, when anyone's power is challenged, they react as if they are the victim. So it's past, partly based on that and partly based on, for example, what you said about how, you know, post reagan neoliberal uh, capitalist and individualistic culture has sort of uh, created this sort of social alienation and sort of overemphasis on power, centralization of power and wealth and status. So would you say that in terms of, you know, tackling the manosphere, it's not just enough to sort of uh, just tackle this idea straight on, but to also sort of push for a wider cultural change, you know, to sort of like, uh, getting back to a less individualistic and more spiritual sort of uh, culture. Would you say that's important as well? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that something that I haven't been able to go into in depth here, but it is really strong when you when they talk about the sexual marketplace is how individualistic they frame um, they frame things and everything is framed in individual solutions. Um, so self help tips, so those kinds of things. And it's it's interesting that that happens because they then. Uh, people in the manosphere talk about how much they want community and connection, uh, but the, the the solutions that they provided through the manosphere are very individualistic, and they don't get much of that community and connection through it. Um, but yeah, I think that um, my argument would always be that we need to try and understand the underlying causes of these issues because tackling the ideology head on does not necessarily work. Uh, it doesn't necessarily change people's minds. It can in, in some instances, um, but it's often about trying to find people a different path to go on, a different path in which they can um, address these uh, these alienation issues. They can address, um, for uh, you're right, that a lot of men um, uh, fear changes in society and, and feel like changes in society have um, meant that they um, have been left behind by society. And that's and a lot of men have been left behind. A lot of people have been left behind by changes in society. Uh, I would argue more of those more of those people have been left behind by neoliberal changes in society than they have by feminist changes in society. Um, but we, we need to address the reality that people have been left behind and try and find, find ways to bring, you know, to catch them up to some extent. Um, there's a whole range of different things that we can be doing um, but it, 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 we've got to, the key message is we've got to find out what the underlying causes are and then try and address those underlying causes rather than just trying to deal with the symptoms and trying to have, which, which end up just kind of being more band-aid approaches. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, thank you everyone for um, attending this event and many thanks to Simon. That was a really interesting talk. So uh, thanks to you. Um, I think one, one other thing we should mention before um, we, we leave is that uh, we're currently uh, looking to fill some committee roles. So any Cambridge students who might be interested in that, um, uh, have a look at our various social media and, and keep up with their emails. Uh, apart from that, thanks for attending. And once again, thanks to Simon. And I hope you'll have a wonderful day. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much.